Well, take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10, 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, one of my favorite books in the Bible. While you're turning there, let me just tell you what we've said over and over in my own personal way, and that is that I really like conferences, don't you? But I love the church. Conferences are fun. They come and they go. A conference is a weekend, a year. And if you go to multiple conferences like some of you do, and we know that you're conference groupies, you go to 12 a year. We don't know how you'd afford it, but we're thankful. Maybe you're the ones who ask for scholarships, but we're thankful that you come. I love Resolved. And yes, God goes to conferences, but God resides in the church. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is sacred ground. This is a hinge of the hinge. The book of Hebrews is the hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. To study the book of Hebrews is to really study the Old Testament and the New Covenant at the same time, and it pulls those two together so we understand what in the world we have the Old Testament for that predicts and plans and so wonderfully prophesies about our Lord Jesus Christ. And the writer of the Hebrews connects those dots for us. You can actually study the book of Hebrews and study every other book of the Bible from the book of Hebrews. The climax of the book really is chapter 10, verse 19. And it begins with a word we're all familiar with if you study the Bible for, at any depth or for any amount of time, and that's the word therefore. After nine and a half chapters of pounding Christology and theology proper, he says, therefore, brethren... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, then... Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love And good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Father, these are precious words that were written by a man we don't know, a man we can't identify, which in some sense is a wonder because we only see it as coming from your divine quill. Teach us and minister to us through this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Three weeks ago, uh, my family, well, my wife and I, along with uh, two of our elders and their wives, Bob Taylor and Bob and Kathy were with us, uh, went on a a three-week, two-week rather, uh, mission trip. We went to do a shepherd's conference, a pastor's conference in Germany, then went over to do a, a, a similar kind of conference in Russia, and then came back through uh, to see some church planters and just do some church history touring in England. Well, while we were there, we took lots of planes, as you might imagine, and we had a flight that went from Frankfurt, Germany, to Samara, Russia. We got in the, on the plane, it was a red eye, we got on the plane about 11, and I think we, we landed in Samara at 3.30 in the morning, and we sit down, and the way they had us situated was that Kim and I were on an aisle in the middle, and there was one seat on the window, and Bob and Kathy were on an aisle in the middle, and there was one seat by the window as well, and we were sitting there having fellowship and having a good time, ready to take off, and these two guys come on. And they are not exactly happy because they want to be together, but they're on opposite ends of our row. And we're, I, let me just say, I like aisle seats a lot. I don't know why, I don't know where you're going to go if you, something happens. But they wanted to get together, so they said, can we change? We were talking about it. We finally, the, the plane was about to take off. We said, well, we'll change after we, we get in the air. So 
we, uh, uh, we get up in the air, and, and, and Kim goes and sits by Kathy, and this other guy comes and sits by me. Now, it was obvious about 30 seconds into his arrival that uh, he, he wasn't um, completely there. And what I mean by that is, is in God's providence, I think his maturity had reached probably 15, 16 years old, but he was a full-grown man probably in his 50s. Special guy, flying with another guy, both Russian. And so we're sitting there and we're talking, and, and my first clue that this was going to be a problem was when I heard the bag that he was moving into the aisle clinking with glass. And so he sits down in very, very broken English, hardly any English, and he began to say, well, uh, uh, you sit with us, thank you. You drink with us. <laughs> the other guy said, we drink together. <laughs> so understand, I'm trying to tell him, look, I just don't drink, and that's, that's for a sermon for another time, but that's not for, but I just don't drink alcohol. I'd rather have iced tea. It's much less expensive and way better tasting. Very strong, no sweetener, just like God made it. Anyway, um, he says, and so he says, we drink, you drink, and he pulls out this glass bottle, and he, and he pours himself and the buddy a drink, and, and then, uh, uh, because we have our, our little meal table there, our, our, the, this is the international flight, so you actually got a meal, and so he, he takes this bottle of gin, and he pours me a glass full in my, and now I have two of my elders and their wives and my wife going, what in the world <laughs> is happening over there? And so I just say, no, no, net, net, uh, net drinkos. I just make up Spanish words. I didn't know. Uh, Greek word, drinkoi, much drinky. I, I didn't know what to say. I, I don't do this. So I give it back. Oh, no, they were, they're deeply offended that I wouldn't drink. So I try to distract them. I said, no, no. And, they, and then the guy in broken English says, why no you drink? I said, I am a Christian. What is that, he said. I said, I, I, and I didn't know, I mean, it's broken English. It's like you're talking to a four or five-year-old because of the broken English. I said, I love Jesus. <laughs> Dead, rise, mine. <laughs> Savior, heaven, someday. <laughs> I'm trying as hard as I can. And so he can't understand what I'm saying, so I get out my Bible. And now I see that the guy ahead of me is like, what's going on back there? And so I think if this guy doesn't understand, maybe he will. And so I turn to John 3, 6, 3 16, and I, I am, I'm saying, for bog. I knew that the Russian word for God was bog. For bog. So loved world. I mean, this is like charades, and I'm trying so hard. And he doesn't get any of it. He, and I finished, and he goes, oh, Jesus. And he pours me another drink. <laughs> so I've got this, this glass of gin, which I didn't know until this point is actually clear. So it looked like water. So I was sweating a little less. And I, I'm starting to, how can I get out of this? And so I'm Christian. I don't drink. And so now he thinks I'm a sissy. And now, now I feel American, American pride. Russians drink, Christian American doesn't, sissy boy. So he gets out his iPad and he says, we like to hunt. <laughs> and he thought he was going to intimidate me a bit. So he pulls out his iPad and he pulls out this huge, this picture of him shooting this Russian boar. I mean, Jonathan, there's tusks were probably four inches. There's beautiful boar. And I'm going, wow, and I'm flipping through. And now he sees that this doesn't offend me. <laughs> and so I'm asking him questions. How big, what caliber, boom, bow, rifle, boom. And so um, he says, uh, you know hunting? And so I got out my iPad. <laughs> and... I said, uh, yeah, and so I'm showing him deer that I've shot with rifles, deer I've shot with bows, and I'm, I'm showing him pigs, and I've shot, and I'm showing him, you know, uh, an impala in Africa and a warthog, and he's just going, what, what, what? But that was not a big deal until I flipped over to my son in Alaska over a bear he shot. My 
son, Luke, Holland, large, look up, large man. <laughs> well, that actually broke, and we were able to talk, and I knew I had to get the gospel as much as I could in fast because he was getting inebriated very fast. God, Jesus, and the, meanwhile, his little special friend becomes my friend, and he puts his arm around me, and he's playing with my hair. <laughs> it's very distracting to share the gospel with someone when a man is playing with your hair. <laughs> I've had many opportunities to share the gospel. This was one of the most difficult, distracting. God, Jesus, bog, Jesus. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he didn't understand. It's clear he didn't get it. But here was the best part of that entire encounter is I said, if I can find someone to explain this to you in Russian, can they call you? And he gives me his card. If you're in Samara, let me know. Bad people in Samara, I'll drive you around. I'm like, yeah, you're going to be having anything to drink that day. But well, <laughs> and, and so we had this, this really good conversation before he stopped remembering things. And I, I gave him my card, and I gave him the address of the church where I was going to be serving. And the point of telling you all that is that I can't describe to you the settled joy I had to tell him, we didn't connect, but I know people at a church who will tell you the gospel, who will serve you, who will help you, who will answer your questions, who will be able to give you something that you'll never find in that bottle. Well, they went to sleep, and I put my head back and just pray, God, use your church in these men's lives. It hit me how really important it was to be able to recommend a church. And I began thinking of my own church. I want people to be able to recommend the church where I attend to say that's a place you can find the gospel. That's a place you can find Jesus. It was also interesting to me to find out that you can't talk about Christianity without ending up talking about the church. Now think about that. You can't talk about Christianity without ending up talking about the church. It's just impossible. Try it sometime. If you don't bring it up, someone will ask you, well, where do you go to church? It's just hand in glove, naturally connecting. Every Christian should be an ecclesiologist. You say, what's that? An ecclesiologist is a theologian who understands and studies the church. Every Christian ought to be a very clear, e uh, let me say it right, ecclesiologist, I almost said economist. That wouldn't be good. Some churches need money. It's not a bad idea. I could use some. But you should be an ecclesiologist. How much do you know about what the Bible says about the church? What if you were asked, what is the church? What if you asked, what is the church not? Could you answer it? Every believer needs a strong theology of the church, not just the pastor, not just the elders, not just the deacons, all of you. If you claim Christ, you need a strong theology of the church. How do you think about the church? What do you think about the church? Churches are not for tours. We were over on this, I mean, we were in Europe, and we, we go, to these, go to these cathedrals, and there's touring, and it's just, it just makes you sick. You walk in, and you go, hey, how you doing? And these old funny guys in funny outfits go, shh. And he's got to sleep. Why are we shh-ing? And I just thought about, uh, I don't know if you remember that first, I think it was first or second year, CJ, after he took over the band, if you were here, he was, uh, the next time he was talking about worship. Worship has all sorts of parameters, especially in heaven. It's amazing how they want you to be quiet and reverent in those cathedrals. Have you ever read Psalm 150? That's a loud psalm. David Zimmer would love that psalm. There's lots of things to hit and percussive repercussions in that psalm. There's stringed instruments in that psalm. They're singing loudly. Psalm 95, shout to the Lord. And we go in the church, shh, don't be irreverent to God. Be quiet. A buddy of mine who's a church planner in England says he likes to wear his hat into those cathedrals. And that they come over and say, you have to take off your hat. And he always says, why? Why? 
And they don't have a good answer. And he says, well, let me tell you why this isn't important and this is. And he goes right into the gospel. I was just thinking, we were going to this, this giant cathedral, and it's beautiful, and it's stained glass high in, a, in Oxford, and just unbe- unbelievably beautiful, incredible Gothic architecture. And um, we're, we're, we're looking at this, and, and it's just, it's beautiful. And you see that when these, these men were building in this and designing this, that people were, were, it was designed to impress people. Big God, big church. I mean, I understand, at least theologically, where they were going with that, but now it's just this this big museum. I was thinking of Isaiah 66. Remember what Isaiah says in 66? He says, um, you know, I made the, earth, the, world, the universe and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a temple you can build for me? And that was the, that was the temple. It wasn't just a, a, a cathedral in Oxford. It was the most magnificent building ever built. He says, where, where, can, you, where can you build something that, that's impressive to me? I made all these things. Now imagine that you were to come over to my house tonight for dinner. And as you were going through, you saw that, that, that I had this, this lamp that I had made when I was six years old for my dad. And it has these electronics and this and old. Pretty cool. I made it. And so you're going through the, the, the living room. I go into the kitchen. We're about to pull out the food. And you're just like, I don't have a gift. And so you grab that lamp. You unplug it. You bring it in. You say, Kim, Rick, I just want you to have this gift as a re- as, as just, just to honor you, to say thank you. I want you to have this lamp. I, I made that lamp. What, 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 is this stupid? That's what God's saying about these buildings. Really? Really? Do you think I'm impressed with church buildings? The local church is not a museum. Let me say one more. The local church is not a museum for truth. It's a hospital for the soul. Now, the book of Hebrews is, is a cool book because it's all about comparisons. The whole point of the book of Hebrews is, I dare you to compare anything to Jesus. I want you to compare everything to Jesus because he will stand the test of any comparison, of any pleasure. He'll stand the comparison against any angel. He'll stand the comparison against every prophet. He'll stand comparison against the law of God itself. He will even stand the test of which is more pleasurable, Jesus or sin. But woven through that whole tapestry in Hebrews is one comparison that the writer comes back to over and over and over again. It's the thing he compares Jesus to more than anything, and that is the priesthood. He's better than every high priest. He's better than every priest. In fact, he is our high priest. And he's at the same time our sacrifice, which we'll talk about in a second. It just doesn't make sense. The analogy on purpose just doesn't make sense. So let's ask this text. Let's ask this text what it begs to be asked. How does the gospel fuel a Christian's involvement in church? We'll just answer that as our outline. How does the gospel fuel... A Christian's involvement in church. The first answer to that question is in verses 20, 19 to 21. Number one, by providing Christ-centered motivation. By providing Christ-centered motivation. Now verses 19 to 21 are a summary of, the, of the, the two main doctrinal points of the whole book of Hebrews. The first point is about our need for access to God. We have no access to God, and we need access to the throne room, to God himself. And the second is how Jesus himself is our access and how Jesus himself provides us access. The second main doctrinal pillar is that we need a high priest who stands before God And we need a sacrifice from that high priest who pleases God. Over and over, the point of Hebrews is the the access to God that we all understood in the Old Testament is the priesthood. I mean, the priest's job was to do this. This is wonderful. The priest's true biblical job was to have a strong relationship with God. And then also to have a relationship with the people. To bring those two together and what? Create that bond. So the book of Hebrews answers, who is Jesus? What has he done? 
The writer provides for us, by the way, in these motivations, two motivations centered on the person and work of Christ. Look in, verses, in verse 19. Uh, he says, Jesus is our access to God. Therefore, brethren, stop right there. Therefore, all that we've said before, now I'm going to apply. Brethren, I'm talking to Christians. I'm talking to believers. Since we, now that's important. He says, since we, twice, and then he says, let us, let us, let us, three times. Very easy to diagram and outline. Since we, since we, these are two motivations, then let us, let us, let us. Since we what? Have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and and a living way. Sacrifices aren't alive, by the way. They're dead. Which he began, he inaugurated, he established for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now, when you come to therefore in the Bible, it's a flashing signal to stop and take note and take care. If you just get that out of this morning, I'll be so happy. When you come to the word therefore in the Bible, stop. It's a bridge It's an intentional cause and effect bridge that the writer is inviting you to cross. Since we, and this is the accent of the whole passage, since we, since we, let us, let us, let us. It's plural. He's talking about the church. Since we as believers. Now, have you ever felt timid approaching a place where you felt like you didn't belong? You just think, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm going to break something. This is wrong. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here. Now, I'm asking about places that you've gone legally like that. We were in uh, uh, um, um, Wittenberg, and uh, a friend of ours who's a missionary over in Germany had set up a, a, it's indescribable, he set up a, a, a meeting with the librarian who oversees Martin Luther's personal library. Steve, you've been there. You've seen this. In this library, they pull out some of the most precious books for a select group of people who can go into this, this tour and, and they, they, they let you look at them. It's sad because no one ever sets up a, um, a meeting to go see this place. Well, they've had these set up, so we go through two locked doors and they lock the door behind us. And I am standing like, like you know, a four-year-old with, with Mrs. Veazey who's got the ruler out. You know, what do I do? What do I do? There's books all over the table. I felt so uncomfortable. I see all these books. Now, I wanted to jump on the books. I wanted to hug the books. I wanted to smell the books. I did smell the books. It was incredible. Very musty old books. These are the books that were in Martin Luther's personal library. And so we're looking at it, looking at it, and we felt so awkward and so uncomfortable. And then the, 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 the curator finally says, you can touch them. <laughs> this one? So Bob picks up a book. And he goes, oh, and then my, our executive pastor, Bob, he says, how much is this one worth? And Christian says, about $10 million. And so he put it back down. <laughs> At one point, we picked up a book, uh, a commentary on Romans, and we turned, and you can see Martin Luther's handwritten notes on this, this book. And I just felt like oh, my heart rate's going, my hands are sweating. I didn't want her to see that because I was afraid it would soil the book. And it was just an incredible experience. And even when we left, I was just like, wow, 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 whoa, can we go back? Wow. I never felt comfortable in there, even though it was an amazing privilege to be there. Magnify that by infinity in terms of walking into the presence of God. You don't belong there. You should never belong be there. You don't deserve to be there. There is no way you and I should ever walk into that. Now, specifically, there was a, a, a very literal thing they could look at. It was the, 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 the tabernacle and, the, and the, uh, the temple architecture. Core the women, core the Gentiles, men, priests, high priest only once a year into the Holy of Holies. Now, we talk about the Holy of Holies. We have Bible dictionaries that have pictures of the Holy of Holies. People say, wow, that's cool. Understand this. Those Jews in that era, they'd never seen the Holy of Holies. They'd heard descriptions. They didn't have a nice Bible encyclopedia to look at a picture of. A model in Jerusalem they could walk around and look at. They were like, that's a mysterious place. And no one can go there. And no one would dare go there. That was a dangerous place. If the high priest went in there in an unworthy fashion, he was killed. Would tie a rope to his... uh, to his foot and have a bell on his, on his um, uh, tunic so that if he fell and dead and they heard the bell stop ringing, they could pull him out and not go get him. This is a dangerous place to be with God. 
And the picture here is there's a veil, that veil, a four inch thick piece of, of material. It was a barrier between man and God symbolically showing the, the holiness of God. It cannot be trifled with. God's eyes are way too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate any sin, Habakkuk 1.13 says. That veil was a barrier to make sure that man couldn't carelessly and irreverently wander into God's presence. Even when the high priest entered in on the Day of Atonement, he had to make very meticulous preparations. He had to wash himself, put on special clothing, bring burning incense to let the smoke cover his eyes from a direct view of, of the, the mercy seat. He had to bring blood with him to make atonement for his sins. Look back up at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. Only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. This passage uh, is the one that inspired Charles Wesley to say, bold, I approach the eternal throne. Who goes boldly into there? Even the high priest did not go boldly into there. But look at the gospel. Look at the gospel in these verses. We have confidence to go into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. That's our access. It's not trifle with. It's not the blood of a, a lamb or a bull or a turtle dove. It was the blood of Jesus. I love the fact that it says, Christ, it says Jesus, not Jesus Christ, not Christ there emphasizing his humanity, that man from Nazareth who is our penal substitution as a man in our place as men. By a new and living way, this was a sacrifice that was new, it was unlike any other, it was perfect, it was once and for all, it was living, this sacrifice didn't die and stay dead. He inaugurated, he paved the way for us through the veil that is his flesh. What's going on here? We need access to God. That's what the writer of the Hebrews says. And we can't get there. But we have someone who has been there and who stands there and has left the door open for us to go in behind him. Can I state the obvious this in this passage? The church, the church is for Christians. The church is for believers. Those who have experienced this living hope, those who believe the gospel. I think it's a very sad chapter of church history that we're living in. I, I shudder to think what will be written about this church, about this, this uh, chapter of church history. It, it, it might go something like, a, like this. The, the time that so many believers thought the church was for unbelievers. Access to God is through Christ. Membership in the church is because of the gospel. Now this is just motivation for him to get to the practical section. Also, he says Jesus is our great high priest in verse 21. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God. It's interesting, he says, house of God, looking back to the temple and looking forward to the church. An incredible blessing here is that Jesus not only opened the way for us to enjoy God's presence, but he also is there himself making sure that that way is extended as an invitation. As Steve was quoting Jonathan Edwards, the door of mercy is flung wide open for all to come in by faith. Priest Jesus was different than every other priest in countless ways, but the most significant way was that he wasn't just the priest, he was also the sacrifice. It breaks down on every category of allegory. Not only that, he sacrificed as the high priest, he sacrificed himself. Into your hands I commit my spirit. God intends for you to compare everything to Jesus and discover his superiority. I want you to think about that. God intends for you to compare everything to Jesus and discover his superiority. 
And the greatest thing they had up to this point in redemptive history was the hope that the high priest would offer a sacrifice that would cover them for maybe a year. You know what the book of Hebrews says? Forget it. Once for all, one sacrifice, that's it. I, 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 it's a sentimental moment to me, but Kim and I were, were a, a, a touring a, a cathedral in, in Italy at one point, and it was about 10 years ago, and we went into um, San Giovanni, St. John's, and we're, we're watching this, and our translator said, look, they're, they're about to do the Mass. I'll translate what he's saying for you. He held up the host, the, the bread, and he, he broke it, and he said, this is Christ crucified again for your sins. Wow. Once. Once for all. That's the motivation to get us to where we really want to be. Why does it matter? What does the gospel do? Secondly, it stimulates church-wide cooperation. And this is the, the theme of the conference. The gospel stimulates church-wide cooperation. Now, beginning at verse 25, you have three phrases. Let us, or the, one phrase repeated three times. Let us, let us, let us. And the plurals in this passage are important. Since we, let us. Since we, let us. The Christian life is not an individual endeavor it's not for monks to go to monasteries and get in their own room and just find God. It's intended to be plural. It's intended to be with others. Listen, Christians who neglect the church become weird, unbalanced, and arrogant. You don't want to be that category. Christians who neglect the church become weird. They become unbalanced. They become arrogant. I had a conversation with a person just a few months ago. It was a bizarre conversation. He says, I'll come to your church if you will say that you believe these things. I said, I don't believe these things. He says, then I won't come to your church. I said, where do you go to church? He said, I don't go anywhere. I said, why? He says, I can't find anybody believe everything I believe. I said, I can't find my own church that believes everything I believe. What, what are you talking about? Who, I mean, everyone's theology is wrong. That'll be corrected when you step into heaven at some little point, right? I mean, how, are you right? He was willing to sacrifice the entire experience with the church because he couldn't find a place that believed everything that he believed. It's because of what we possess in Christ that we have a serious obligation to live in a very specific, defined, and holy way. So, verse 22 says, we have mutual collaboration for genuine worship. This is wonderful. Mutual collaboration for genuine worship. Verse 22, let us draw near. Now that would have shocked them. He's talking about the Holy of Holies. He says, let us draw near. Let's boldly go in. We have access to God. We have an inaugurated way. Confident to enter the holy place. Let us draw near with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I mean, the verse represents a powerful and compact how-to formula for drawing near to God, how to worship. You want to increase your worship personally? You want to increase your worship corporately? Here's a very simple three-step how-to formula. First of all, generate sincerity in what you believe. Don't just have it be a dogma that you affirm. Let it be something you genuinely believe and think about and meditate on. Let your faith be increased. We draw one near with a sincere heart. We're genuine, full assurance of faith, what we believe. Also, forgiveness from our most hidden sins. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Here's the sad part. Here's the deal. Listen, all of us, all of you, I'm included, we have sins that no one knows about except God. And even those we've confessed, only God knows the full depth of the treachery against him that that sin really is. Our consciences condemn us, but the cross forgives us, cleanses us, makes us acceptable to God in the moment of worship, acceptable to God in the moments without worship. This third little how-to formula, glorifying God in your body. Our bodies washed with pure water. Lots of debate on this. Is this baptism? It's probably a reference, I think, to Ezekiel where the, the, the washing is in reference to repentance. 
I liken it to 1 Corinthians 6, 20. You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God where? In your body. Find something to repent of. Draw near to God in sincerity with forgiveness, glorifying God in your body. Notice it says, let us do this. You can worship on your own, but you should worship with others. Let us do this together, which implies a certain level of confession. When our hearts are not sincere, when our faith is weak, when our, when our consciences condemn us, when our bodies are full of the record of sin. But he goes on in verse 33 to say, there's also mutual accountability in disciplined perseverance. Genuine worship, but also perseverance. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This verse is about staying faithful in what you believe and confessing what you believe. This is the the great doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Stick with it. Why? Because there are those who defect from it. Demas defected from it. Judas defected from it. Diotrephes defected from it. Now, there's a difference between defecting and having a moment of weakness. I mean, has anyone done anything worse than live with Jesus for three years, then be asked publicly, do you know this man, and say, no, I don't. Not once, not twice, but three times. Moments of weakness for which Peter was forgiven. There's a difference between a moment of weakness and a final blasphemy. The confession here, the public affirmation of our faith. No man's faith is personal, it's public. It's a confession. You tell people what you believe. We confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. It's not something you do in your heart and don't tell anybody. No man's religion is private. It's all intended to be public. He says hope. The gospel is saturated with hope, hope, hope. Hope is so important that Peter uses it as shorthand for the entire gospel. He says, sanctify Christ in 1 Peter 3, 15. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks to get an account. You would expect him to say of the gospel. What does he say? Of the hope that's within you. Tell him what God's done in your life. One of my favorite parts of the book of Acts is Paul. When his life is on the line, at least twice publicly, before Felix and before Agrippa. And they said, tell us what you believe. And you'd expect Paul. Paul wrote Romans. Paul wrote Galatians. He wrote justification by faith in Romans 3, 4, and 5. I mean, he could have laid it out. Paul stands before Felix and Agrippa and says, I just want to tell you my testimony. Let me tell you what happened on the road to Damascus. Why? Because in his testimony was the gospel and rich personal theology. Don't ever underestimate the power of your testimony. Without wavering. Here's where we find that perseverance of the faith. Without wavering. It indicates there's the possibility of wavering, of stumbling, of defecting. But notice how the verse ends. But we have Jesus who is faithful. The perseverance of the saints is tightly linked to accountability and encouragement in the local church. Oh, we like to talk about Calvinism, the tulip, and the pea, and the perseverance of the saints. Listen, the perseverance of the saints is tightly linked to accountability and encouragement in the local church. You will likely not stay true if you do it alone. The climax is... This has been a race to get to verses 24 and 25. In these two verses, they talk about church, church involvement, church attendance. We have to talk about this. This is a conference on the church. Should I go to church? Where do I go to church? I love the the sermons that have come before. I mean, Steve, when you outlined that, um, and, and can I put you on the spot in front of everybody? I told him, I said, that sermon needs to be put in a little booklet on how to decide where to go to church and given to every high school graduate who's going off to college. That's your move, isn't it? <laughs> it was outstanding. Purity of the church, the awesome. I mean, what Dr. Muller and John and, and uh, my friend John Rourke just absolutely. I, I was having trouble thinking, what am I going to say after that? 
Such a fine exposition. The point is, you can't do it alone. You cannot do it alone. Let us, mutual encouragement from strategic gatherings. That's where we're going next. Mutual encouragement from strategic gatherings. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider effective church involvement demands preparation and planning. Listen, if you're going to be good at doing church, if you're going to be effective and faithful, effective church involvement demands preparation and planning. It has to be considered. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another day after day as long as they're still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Encourage one another. Consider one another. How can you be involved, involved in other, others' lives and, and love and ministering to them to show them good deeds and how to do good deeds? Christ shepherds his people through the active participation of other believers in their lives. I want you to hear that again because that involves the people some of you are sitting with. Some of the people who've confronted you. Some of the people who you don't necessarily like. Christ shepherds his people through the active participation of other believers in their lives. One of the most horrific examples of where this went south, even though it's in the Old Testament and on the church, is in the book of 2 Samuel. I, you don't need to turn there. I'm just going to read this very, very quickly. I, I, I'm overwhelmed by the, the message, the multiple layers of practical application in, in 2 Samuel. You, you should know what's going on in, in this passage. This is the story of David. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it's the famous story of David and Bathsheba. All of us know that story moderately well, but I wonder if you've ever seen exactly what's going on in that story, because sometimes we misinterpret it. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab, Hebrew word is shalech, the word sent, it's all over this, this chapter. David sent Joab and his servants with him. All of Israel, they destroyed, the, destroyed Ammon, besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. We've all heard sermons on this. He should have been out fighting. He was at home. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed, walked out on the roof of, his king, of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. You don't bathe with your clothes on. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. The Hebrew means she was beautiful in physical form. Look at this next phrase. So, David sent. Same word, shelech. And he inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? It's obvious from the fact that that question came back that they understood why David was asking about Bathsheba. Verse 4, David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, and lay with, he lay with her. And when, when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, which would have taken seven days according to Leviticus, she could have been in the king's palace for a week. She returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I'm pregnant. Then David sent to Joab. It gets all the way through this passage. Here's the point. David and Bathsheba were not the only people who knew about this sin. And they weren't the only people to know about this sin before it happened. One of the subtle underlying messages of David and Bathsheba is that they saw this train wreck coming and no one said, stop. No one said, no. No one said, repent. I have to look at one more. Look at, look at the, the end of verse 27. The thing that David did was evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then the Lord sent. The church is the answer to Abel's question. Yes, I am my brother's keeper. 
You are your brother's keeper. Christian love never winks at another sin. You are called to stimulate others to love and good deeds, to do what's right and to love others relationally and in your duty to do what's right. By the way, don't miss the triad here. I wish we had time to go in this. It's right back to what, what Steve was saying. Faith, hope, and love are in this passage. Assurance of faith, confession of hope, encouraging one another in love. But here's where I wanted to get to. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another as, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We can talk all day about others missing church, all day about why others miss church. Why do you miss church? Come on, were you a, did you get a perfect attendance word in the last 52 weeks of church? Did you, did you miss any church? Why do you, why have you, why will you miss church? Gathering with believers. Now, listen, let's be careful here. We've said all weekend, this is not the church. It is, in a sense. A Christian gathering comprises the, the, the universal church. What we're talking about here is the local church with your pastors, elders, leaders, Look, there are legitimate reasons to miss church. If you have the flu, don't come, please. Please don't come. And if you come, stay away from me. You come, you see the pastor, you're a hero. I just want you to know, pastor, <coughs> I just, I'm sick, but I just want to come and hear the, <coughs> the word. Real, no, go home, brother. There's CDs available. But I think the main reason, reason Christians skip church is a lack of preparation. The main reason you skip church, you miss church, is a lack of preparation. You're not ready for church. You haven't considered your ministry at church. You haven't planned it. Okay, those of you who are in Crossroads are, are going to roll your eyes when I say this because I've probably said this three times a month the whole time I was pastoring. It's this. Sunday morning begins Saturday night. That got you excited, huh? Sunday morning begins Saturday night. It's just amazing. People are falling asleep in church. I can't imagine why I'm so tired. I went to bed at 3 this morning. I was watching this. Wow, wow. McFly, what are you thinking? Three in the morning, you get up, you're not going to be ready for church. Sunday morning begins Saturday night. If you want to have a worshipful experience on Sunday morning, you don't decide that at 8.30 in the morning. Not only that, if you're not ready for Sunday morning, guys, things happen Sunday morning. <laughs> when when I, our sons were younger, I was preaching at Grace Church and actually said, I was talking about this issue, and I said, I just feel like Satan, you know, Satan goes to church. We all know Satan goes to church. He wants to be here and distract us and prevent us from worship and tempt us. And, but I think Satan gets to church because he rides in my van. <laughs> what I intended for that to mean was there's conflict that can happen. One of my sons elbowed my wife and said, is he calling me Satan? Here's what I've discovered in my own life. Satan whispers his best lies on Sunday mornings. If you can be distracted, you will be distracted. If you can be other-minded than church, you will be other-minded. He whispers his best lies to me on Sunday mornings. If there are reasons to church, reasons to miss church, listen, a lack of desire is not one of them. I don't feel like going to church. Can I give you a hint? Most times when your pastors get up, they didn't wake up. It's a great morning. I just can't wait. <laughs> I don't want to sing. I feel like I wake up on Sunday morning and Satan is sitting on my chest with his arms folded. Yeah, I got you covered today. I feel guilty. I feel distracted. 
They're in a hurry. My sons display their depravity in front of me, <laughs> which reveals my depravity in front of them. Is church precious to you? Are you planned? Are you, re- are you ready to come to church to minister? I'd studied ecclesiology in seminary, took the course, thought I had a good doctrine of the church. I went to Krasnoyarsk, Russia, <clears throat> about, oh, it's got to be like almost 20 years ago now. First time I went to Russia, flew into Krasnoyarsk. It was freezing. The, the, the airplane was about 400 yards from the, the, um, the terminal, and we had to walk over. There was 32 below zero. And uh, it was called my eyeballs froze. It was unbelievable. And I, uh, I didn't think I could breathe. It was uh, never been that cold before. And that was, w- they don't count wind chill over there and they really should, um, especially on a tarmac. So we get in this, in the end, we're doing this conference and this Sunday I'm going to go preach at this church. It's a cool church. I like this church. Preachers, you would like this church because they had five preachers. I was one of them. And I asked them, how long do you want me to go? So they said, till you finish. I mean, it's cold outside. It's, it's good. So I showed up early. This was bizarre. It was a strange morning because it was so cold. We, we should pull up into the parking lot, and there are no cars in the parking lot, maybe two over in the corner buried in snow. and It's kind of weird. And we walk in, and I heard singing in the worship center, in the sanctuary. And I thought, what is that? And we walked around the corner, and the church was half full from the front to the back with believers singing. And I remember walking, because I was, here was the stage, and, and the, the congregation was out here, and so I came in the side door, and I looked at them, and I'm like, wow, they're, they're, they're sitting. there's nobody there. Then I looked closely, and the first three rows were all women, older women. So I asked Alexei, I said, what, what is this? And they said, well, they can't wait to get to church and the worship service isn't long enough for them, and they don't feel like they sing enough, so they come early and sing by themselves. Then, I said, what's up with the old ladies? <laughs> it came out better then. <laughs> I said, those are special ladies they give preference to in the best seats in the church. Because all of their husbands were martyred because of Christ. And my ecclesiology changed that morning from thinking that we need to go to church, from thinking that we have to go to church, to these precious people who see church as something they get to do and boldly worship. The Lord's Day is significant. We've preached on that over the years. My first, co- first uh, sermon at Resolve was on communion. I remember saying, well, you got, you got one chance you're preaching on communion? I mean, there are better verses in the Bible. Really? I studied that because I thought that I didn't really understand communion. That, that sermon eight years ago actually reoriented, re- redid the plumbing in my own thinking about the Lord's table. Encourage one another. Do you come? Are you ready to encourage one another? Do you have a plan to encourage one another? Do you have someone, someone's faces in your mind? When I go to church, I'm going to encourage them to love. I'm going to encourage them to do what's right. I'm going to encourage them to worship. I'm going to encourage them that they can draw near. I'm going to tell them that they have bold access. I'm going to talk to them about the gospel. I'm not just going to talk to them about college football yesterday. Can I say it as simply as possible? Not attending church is a sin. There are reasons not to attend church. We can talk about that. But as a general rule, not attending church is a sin. Let me go one step further. Coming to church for the wrong reasons is a sin. Wow, there's this cute girl. Well, I'm all for finding your cute girl wife at church. But if she's distracting you, I mean, marry her. I mean, just don't be distracted at church. And you guys think we don't see it. I mean, the pastor, preachers, up, we're, we're, we see the same guy sitting behind the same girl, you know, just like, man, her hair, so cool. It's when it just moves, I was, wow, we see you. (laughs) 
The last phrase is important. All the more as we see the day drawing near, the day of judgment, Jesus is coming, and he expects a prepared bride who's encouraged each other, made each other more sinless because of our relationships. To sin less because of our relationships. Now here's the knife in your back of this passage. Ready? Let us do all this implies that there are people who are receptive to this. What if you are the target on a Sunday morning and someone shows up and they think, I'm gonna encourage you to love and good deeds and they come and try to minister to you and you think, dude, you're way too spiritual. It's, I haven't had but one Starbucks today. What's up? Are you ready to receive the ministry of the church and to be involved in the ministry of the church? Are you excitable by others' encouragement about the gospel? Can you be excited about being at church? Can you be excited about the truth of God? Are you receptible? The most pervasive illustration in the New Testament about the church is of a human body. It's used more than any other illustration. Lots of illustrations, a building, foundation, plant, the human body is what Paul uses most. He's most descriptive about. In the book of 1 Corinthians, he says, it's like a body. Jesus is the head, and we're like members. We're like parts of the body. He even goes, he says, he talks about eyes and hands and feet. We all function differently in the body of Christ. Uh, one, of, one of my fondest memories is I grew up with uh, my cousin, Terry. She was about six years younger than me. She had cerebral palsy. And uh, sweet girl, she, uh, she actually received Christ. She, her mind was fully there. She had no control over being able to speak or her, or her limbs. In fact, we'd sometimes put socks on her hands so she wouldn't scratch herself because she would go into spasms. <sighs> Love spending time with Terry. Brown eyes that would melt you. She loved to hear you sing, especially if you weren't good. She would <laughs> smile. I used to carry her around. And she actually received Christ when she was 11 by looking up. Looking up meant yes, closing tight meant no. That's the only way she could communicate. She received Christ from looking up. I, I, something special about that. But I remember looking at Terry, and when she would go into these spasms, it just, hard to watch. Because the panic in her face. Help me. I have no control of my body. And I wonder sometimes if my precious cousin, who now, by the way, she died from pneumonia when she was 12, her faith became sad and her body became new. I wonder if sometimes the Lord looks at his body similarly, not listening to the instructions of the head, fighting itself, scratching itself, you are a part of the body so you can serve the body that is Christ's. You are a part of the body of Christ so you can serve the body of Christ. And come to church ready to serve, to minister, to encourage. Come to church ready to be encouraged and to be served and to fight sin and make it Make it a community effort. The emerging church has stole our word. I love the word community. We are a community of redeemed people intended by Christ to work for him with, for each other. What we can enjoy in the church is because of our great high priest in heaven.